Well, welcome everybody uh, to the next edition of Clearly Cannabis. Uh, it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation tonight. My name is Marguerite Arnold. Uh, I am a journalist covering this space from Europe, uh, from Germany, as well as a tech geek and the co-founder of several startups, uh, including CannaClear and Canalist EU. Uh, with me tonight uh, on, the, on the team side is also uh, Patrick Dougherty, who is, uh, the, I guess, founder, co-founder of Canalist EU, as well as CannaClear, as well as Martin Weller. And you can find out more about us on our websites, et cetera. But tonight, I am very, very delighted and honored to have also with us mm -hmm. uh, a member of Germany's distribution, Cannabis Distribution Club. And it really, really is. Um, Linus Weber started his company a couple of years ago and has since become, I, I would say, one of the hottest distribution companies in the German landscape. He's a millennial, he's German. And I thought that it would be really, really awesome to have our sort of lowdown and questions asked to Linus tonight because there are a ton of issues going on in the German distribution market. So first of all, welcome to Clearly Cannabis, Linus. Nice to meet you, Marguerite. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, anytime. As I have told you, the best, one of the reasons I like them so much is they are you know, surviving in a German cannabis market, which is interesting. And maybe you can tell us a little about that but are also open to a lot of new innovations. So Linus, why don't you just quickly just talk about, you know, high level pitch kind of you know, overview. How did you start Nimbus? Yeah. And when? Yeah, well, and um, um, that's, uh, that's a good question to start with. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, basically, um, uh, my background is a typical economics. Uh, I studied here at one of the, uh, the major universities here in Germany, and one would think uh, pharma is quite uh, 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 yeah, a mile away or something like that. But uh, I ended up in compliance right uh, before I started uh, my studies uh, and uh, was working in the field of compliance uh, ever since. Um, then moved towards quality because there are very, very common uh, areas there. And once you're uh, sort of done with the with the financial part, uh, the next big thing in compliance was the was the yeah was the pharma industry. Uh, I worked for Fresenius Medical Care, built up the compliance and quality uh, program, uh, and uh, in the end, uh, yeah, it was a great experience, um, uh, and um, it brought me into cannabis. I uh, met uh, uh, one guy in uh, in uh, the U.S. Uh, who was very well connected. Uh, and was also a cannabis patient. So um, uh, he sort of uh, guided me through. So I was like, hang on, what, you're taking cannabis besides your dialysis uh, treatment? Uh, and, I, and he said, yes, of course, I'm doing that. And uh, that was the first touch point. It was in yeah, 2016, basically. Um, um, and then uh, it never left my head uh, that you can actually cure uh, certain diseases and make therapies better. Um, uh, so I decided in uh, 2018 uh, with uh, two other uh, guys to uh, found Nimbus Health and uh, yeah, create one uh, of the distributors in the German market. That's the history. That's 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 already it. So uh, it's uh, um, you're you're get caught up uh, in in conversations and uh, yeah, uh, simply something great can be developed. Well, you certainly have established yourself, right, in the market. And that's one of the things that I was hoping we might talk about today without giving any way of, of your secrets and et cetera. Um, what you have now established yourself as a company who is really on the leading edge in terms of the German distribution market, because I mean, obviously you may have met somebody from the US, but the market here is completely different. So in the, in, in the last couple of years, you have gone through a path which is not easy to begin with, and maybe you can talk about that. So just sort of in general terms, how, is, how do you go about being a German distributor for people who don't really understand the market and the steps that you actually have to go through? So um, yeah, um, uh, thanks again. Um, well, basically when we, when we dive into Nimbus, so that was the the baby we developed in the course of 2018 and, and, and for, uh, um, uh, for those who don't know, in, in December we uh, got incorporated. 
Um, well, Nimbus is uh, a fully licensed pharmaceutical wholesaler and manufacturer. Uh, we have our own warehouse facility, so every license is directly connected to ourselves. Uh, we have everything in-house uh, uh, as well as an independent sales force and so on. Um, and yeah, in order to yeah, promote the cannabis-based products of our uh, uh, brands that we are uh, taking care of. Uh, of course, it was quite a rough start in the beginning. Um, uh, you are uh, alone, um, uh, on your own, uh, and have a huge sort of uh, set of licenses you um, have to get in order to really step onto the market. So it's it's yeah, it was it was basically a uh, a setup you don't usually see when you look at normal retail business. Uh, however, since um, what I said in the beginning, since I'm uh, already in the field of compliance and quality, knew how to sort of set up the certain things, um, uh, 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 I uh, took my balls together basically in order to sort of say, okay, Linus, you can, you can crack that. And uh, uh, with the help of uh, my co-founder and partner, Alessandro Rossoni, uh, we set up the company and got fully licensed, not only as a wholesaler and distributor, uh, but also as a manufacturer. Uh, so we are also licensed under paragraph 13 uh, uh, of the uh, pharmaceutical law in Germany, as well as paragraph 72, which makes us uh, or gives us the ability to import uh, from even outside the European Union. Okay, so slow back. That, that is precisely now, that was a good place to stop, because I want to sort of underline for people who are listening to this outside of Germany, <clears throat> maybe in, in, say, the US or, or maybe even Canada, that to be a cannabis distributor here is like being a pharmaceutical distributor. It is like you're having, you have to have a special license to handle a narcotic, which is what cannabis is, medical cannabis is classified here as. And it is not like being a distributor anywhere else, right? So my next question is to you, how does that then impact your interaction with cannabis producers who are outside of, Germany or even outside of Europe when you talk to them about what you're looking for when it comes to product? Yeah, um, well, basically it all started um, with the ICBC in, uh, in 2018 where I was on um, and uh, I got the first sort of touch points uh, with, the, with the industry and producers. Um, so clearly uh, what was sort of uh, uh, a thing for me in the, in the first place was um, that um, it wasn't handled as a uh, real pharmaceutical compared to, for example, if you're talking about aspirin or uh, no, aspirin is probably not the the the, the good example here. Yeah, let's let's take opioids. Um, so basically, uh, in the beginning um, uh, on this ICBC, uh, one uh, guy I want to quote said, uh, "You basically have for every jurisdiction a specialist." Um, and um, I can tell now you don't need a specialist for every jurisdiction. Uh, in Germany, it's you need a specialist for every state. Um, that's comparable to the US. However, uh, one state is uh, in the US is as big as Germany um, or even yeah, a, a couple of times bigger. Uh, so um, it's very, very sort of um, a special law you have to look at. There are different regulations from state to state. Um, and uh, you really need to make your um, producers uh, understand that this market in Germany is very regulated uh, and set up in a way that, uh, um, yeah, it's completely different if you want to import, for example, in, uh, in, in Schleswig-Holstein, which is uh, uh, the area surrounding Hamburg, uh, compared to, uh, for example, Hessen, where we are located near Frankfurt. Well, let, let, let's get into this as well, because not a lot of people have talked about the, diff or the, the, the similarities in some ways between the German market and the US market, and even to a, to a certain extent, the Canadian market too is like this. So you now have federal reform, but every single state is different. So I guess this is true, Martin, maybe you can step in on this one. Every single state in Canada is also slightly different in terms of how certain things are interpreted. Like it. Canada, but you're absolutely right. It's, right, uh, so like the online, the online sales with one thing, and they're like different things. But in Germany, there definitely has been the development of an awareness that it's not just enough to have a distribution license in one state. You have to have, I would say, national coverage if you're a distributor trying to bring in a lot of brands into the market. And then you have to understand the differences in each one of those states. So my next question is, um, you know, Linus, is it, are those prerequisites from your perspective 
driven by state law that is just there? Or is it like insurance law that's in the different German states because that also affects coverage? What are the drivers for those different regulations and how do they differ? Well, basically it's the people uh, behind it and, uh, and that's good. Basically we all have a, uh, a very, very abstract uh, law uh, or GMP guidelines uh, in front of us. Uh, and every state, every person uh, in the local authorities, of course, have the ability to shift around that. So, of course, there are differences in, for example, if we say packaging, but that's nothing new to the pharma industry. If you're, uh, if you're connected to it, if you knew how certain things are set up, of course, they give you sort of uh, um, um, yeah, guidelines. But those right. guidelines can be extended in, 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 in both ways. So um, which uh, one, one uh, author, local authority might accept one thing and the other uh, might accept it in another way. Uh, we had the discussion and uh, I clearly want to state an example with Betrocan, for example. Um, Betrocan was first imported with a respective label. Uh, the label was some important points were in were in German. Um, some others uh, were were completely in in Dutch language. Um, so, uh, for example, some states had to relabel them. Others uh, wouldn't uh, have to do that. So there are certain sort of differences. But by now, of course, since it's a new uh, it's a new drug on the market. Um, um, it just needs to develop. So by now, for example, uh, we have a better can now labeled in nearly all states, uh, which of course is just a um, reason for that um, the local authorities, of course, do step together, do have their uh, summits as well, where they sit together and try to figure out the perfect law. So in the beginning, of course, it helps um, that it's uh, um, yeah, regulated, but a little bit unstructured, so you can really work within the guidelines. Um, but um, more and more, it more moves into a very standardized setup, uh, which is good, uh, which is definitely uh, a step forward. Um, uh, but still, uh, in, in certain things, for example, primary packaging, there are different IDs between the different states. And also when it, when it, uh, when it comes to uh, importation, um, uh, importation even inside the European Union, uh, it's always uh, difficult uh, to really uh, understand what your uh, uh, respective local authority wants. Um, and I just realized by looking at uh, various different uh, brands we are working with and also our competitors, which we of course do exchange information with, um, we, we definitely see um, that uh, these kind of, um, uh, these kind of uh, sort of importation uh, procedures do differ from state to state. Uh, but um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, to, be, to be honest, uh, I'm uh, pretty sure that this will get aligned in the course uh, of, uh, yeah, just uh, in, in time uh, in the next, over the next five to 10 years, let's, uh, let's take it to that point. And are you operating only in Germany at this point? At this point, we are operating only in Germany, but you um, uh, need to understand where does it start? So what, where does operation start? Does operation start if I qualify, for example, a company that is producing flour in New Zealand or a company uh, uh, I look at in Canada? Um, uh, is that already starting where I'm working? Um, if yes, then I'm working, of course, outside because I'm doing consulting on the end in order to receive the GMP certification or um, to even um, yeah, uh, get the product in because that's, that's one crucial point. Uh, it's not about the big tons uh, in this market and I'm really fed up about talking about tons and, and hundred thousands of kilograms and so on. Um, let's first bring one gram in and then we're good um, because that's, that's what's, uh, what's, what's needed. We need to have a, um, a, respective, a respective supply chain, but uh, sorry that I'm now moving into a di different direction. Of course, we are focused on Germany. We do have partnerships in Poland and France, uh, Italy. Uh, where we are directly connected to other distributors who are able to sort of serve, serve the market. However, we see ourselves as a uh, player in Germany with very sort of a regulated market, a very strict market, a strict monograph. So uh, Germany can display the entry gate into Europe for all um, uh, uh, companies that are producing cannabis outside the European Union. So is your expectation that you would move into other countries then? 
Yeah, of course. I mean, we are already doing so. We have um, um, contracts in place where we are able to sort of also shift the products uh, outside Germany. Uh, we do hold an uh, exportation license uh, within the European Union and two uh, two states outside the European Union. So, of course, uh, we see ourselves moving to other countries. Uh, that's definitely uh, a goal of us. But uh, let's be honest, Germany is the interesting market now. We try to develop our home market first and then move into other jurisdictions in the course uh, of the next uh, couple of years. And then um, Alejandro, I believe you had a question you wanted to ask? You're Are muted, you I think. Okay, I'm gonna- Try it again. You have Martin, are you, do you have any, do you, do you have a follow-up or do you want to keep? I did have a question, but I just want to hear if Alejandro, maybe we can hear him now. No, no, your microphone's not working. What, um, now? Now you're there. There you go, Perfect. thank you. Um, so my question is mainly, what are the drivers to select the product that you will be willing to distribute into the German market? I mean, what, what, what is the things that you look at them? Exactly, um, uh, and that's uh, what uh, uh, took a lot of time away last year, uh, really uh, developing a relationship with a producer uh, that is sort of uh, next level. Um, of course, there are great uh, uh, existing uh, producers on the German market they are able to serve. Uh, one thing uh, that is the most important thing is that they have the patient that pharma market needs. Um, so uh, we are not giving ourselves um, uh, deadlines that are unachievable. Uh, and that's what I've seen in the, in the past. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, a GMP certification takes two to three years. Uh, let's be honest. So it simply takes a process to really uh, develop. So a strong relationship, uh, um, yeah, uh, like-minded people in the, in the first place. Second thing is really care about the patients. Um, that's, that's one crucial point because we don't need products that, uh, are named same but have different kind of uh, uh, strains in there now and then. Um, so what we are looking at is on consistency. Consistency would be the second point. So do you able to consistently supply the market in an sort of ongoing uh, and um, growing uh, way uh, in terms of um, in terms of volume? Uh, that's that would be the second point. And thirdly, um, that's uh, in the end the most important point is uh, that they create a product uh, that has a certain value uh, to it. So I, um, of course, we do have producers out there who um, uh, grow cannabis uh, because it has a certain stigma. Uh, it, in some instances, it, it is simply a lifestyle product because um, it is consumed even um, as a non-pharmaceutical. Um, but uh, uh, it sort of it it, it, searches, it 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 urges for a lot of um, uh, um, yeah um, attention in the end, um, meaning that uh, we want to have a value add product uh, uh, is a product that has certain observations was used in uh, in in little patient observations um, and has a certain value to it. Of course, I'm not talking about clinical trials that are carried out like for a finished pharmaceutical, but anything that is of value. Uh, that we can use in order to sort of show that this product is working in a certain way or has been tested, has been used by a patient. Those three key things are the what, things we are looking at uh, if we're talking to a producer. And as you've probably followed the news, uh, we do have uh, a set of producers now on our, um, uh, in our uh, team, in our Nimbus family, how we call it, uh, in order to sort of really facilitate those goals. Um, and those people are very like-minded people uh, looking at the market, how we are doing, uh, not talking about tons, talking about the consistent supply, a growing consistency uh, in the respective sort of um, um, yeah, way how they uh, cultivate products and how they brought, bring them into the market. Uh, May I follow up just? Um, okay. so, do you do the market segmentation and then you go out and look for the producer that will uh, supply to that uh, unmet need or the uh, producers come to you and they say i can meet that need in the market that i um, recognize in the german market and will try to convince you to take this product on and pedal it and try to see if you can introduce it so how, how it 
what's the dynamic there? Very, very good question. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro. Um, well, basically, what we are looking at when we when we uh, when we look at the market, of course, we have the market knowledge. For me, it's about collaboration. Um, we need to work together in this market. Nobody will win uh, when he's sort of a at the forefront thinking that cannabis is consumed like water, building huge uh, uh, facilities in order to grow, grow, grow. That's not the thing what we are looking at. We need to invest money into really help the patients, invest into clinical studies. So I don't understand why uh, uh, certain sort of uh, um, uh, uh, companies, companies are moving out of this thing. right? Complete companies uh, exactly. never meaningless, right? No, 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 no. I mean, that's that's the crucial point. I mean, we as a young company, of course, can't invest. We are a distributor. We are the market makers in Germany. We understand the market. We know which product is needed, and of course, we do select a certain kind of products together with our producers. Um, what what the current market uh, landscape looks like, I, I don't I don't need to deep dive on that. Everybody knows that high THC products are the one things which are sort of at least on the flower market are urged for the most. Um, but uh, if we're looking on, in three years, in five years time, we are not talking about the, the, the high THC rails, we are talking about additional evidence that is with it. And this is of course something what we develop together with the, uh, with the respective producers um, in order to develop a, of course, a product that is needed um, and is taken up. Uh, rather than a product that simply looks at high THC, certain uh, um, other uh, um, um, uh, terpenes that are even increasing a, a high or something like that. Uh, we really want to sort of, uh, in a way, uh, create unique products. Of course, every producer is different, and I know where this question is probably going. How can you handle those? Of course, to convince uh, uh, the, to convince the doctor, that's the crucial part. Um, however, we, we found strategies um, in order to help the respective brands to develop um, a marketing plan that uh, helps them to convince the doctors in the right way. Well, let me, let me jump in. Can I ask one quick question, Lens? Um, what do you see as the biggest challenges right now? What are the areas that you would need help in or what are the biggest areas that you're working on right now? What's, what's currently, what are the roadblocks right now maybe? Um, well, it's, it's, it, I wouldn't say it's a roadblock. Um, uh, it's, it's basically something uh, where you just simply need to uh, build a bridge. Um, so, of course, we do have a lot of subscribers currently in Germany. I think the one thing what, we, what is most challenging is really um, uh, convincing the, the, the doctors in a, in a large scale. We had a similar setup uh, when uh, opioids first came to the market. Everyone said, we can't give out opioids. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's harming the patient. And, mid and at the moment, um, if you look in how much opioids are prescribed, it's, it's massive. Um, so it's, it, there is a similarity, even though the product is completely different from one another. So in my view, of course, it's the acceptance of the product and uh, getting rid of the stigma uh, in, in, in the market. That's, that's one of the major challenges, definitely because only with doctors we will achieve uh, the uh, acceptance on the one hand but also the knowledge on the product um, if we don't collect this knowledge or uh, if we cannot collect this uh, knowledge uh, in a wrong way we will not meet uh, the goal we all have in our minds and uh, uh, and yeah uh, replacing uh, certain um, therapies with uh, cannabinoid um, add-on therapies, yeah. Well, that leads me to... Even, I, even, I even thought about changing the name of cannabis, but I think nobody will believe. Uh, so we are sort of looking now in cannabinoid uh, uh, th therapies, but still uh, it has cannabis in the name. And uh, yeah, some, some, uh, somehow this uh, always big, has a big like red light in every... Uh, in every, um, in every head uh, where they say, no, it's a drug, it's an illegal drug. Uh, um, unfortunately, in German, uh, we don't really have the ex uh, sort of difference between drug and drug anymore. So um, uh, uh, drugs are more the negative part, even though drugs have always been sold in pharmacies, even in the, fir in the, even in the former times. Well, okay, so, so this is the next piece of this, right? Because this is also unusual, if, especially for those people who have, don't know much about the German market, you also, on top of all of the other things you have to do, namely select the product, find the producers, get your paperwork in order, get all of the XM together. I mean, there's a, there's a range of activities that you have to do, but you also have a role in educating doctors, right? So my question to you is, especially now, how are you as a distributor doing that kind of thing? 
Exactly. So and uh, yeah, exactly. Education is a huge thing. Um, there are so many education programs now out there. Uh, of course, everyone is trying to educate the market in a way. However, what, what I believe um, the problem is that none of the really education is, is independent. Um, we have institutes in Germany, uh, which are owned uh, in the end uh, by uh, a, a group of Canadian companies or so on. So there is no real independent education. What we are trying to achieve is since we have um, different brands uh, we represent uh, to make a really independent way of uh, educating the doctors because that's what it's needed. Uh, it's not needed that we have an education platform where we sort of are online and uh, giving giving advice because let's let's be honest. Um, uh, after a um, yeah 10 12 hour working day, how doctors are dealing with. Um, who is going online afterwards and then checking something. That's not what we need. We need education in a, in a, in a way that we, of course, have key opinion leaders who stand behind the products. Um, that's the first place. But then in the end, really go on their respective interesting sort of um, uh, education platforms, which are out there, for example, the Schmerzliga, which is the pain association, um, or other big events of the, uh, of the, of the pain therapists. Um, it's, it's not another cannabis um, uh, conference we need to go on. We need to really interact with the society. We don't have to interact with, with each other because we then uh, always move into uh, the idea that we all need an owned uh, education program. There needs to be an indication, uh, an education program that is simply free for everyone. Uh, we are able to provide our information to that in order to educate the market more and more. And there are certain companies out there already. Uh, Ambus is just one of them uh, where education is independently uh, available. Uh, and uh, yeah, there, there, there is the possibility um, and there is possibility of sharing this knowledge. Of course, and uh, to expand that question, of course, um, we shouldn't get rid of education on a specific product. That is urgently needed as well. However, the overall education should be independently uh, uh, set up. And um, by now we don't have this uh, independent uh, organ yet. Um, of course, we are trying to facilitate it, but at the moment, of course, we're working with our brands in order to educate doctors um, in a very individual way. But to educate doctors, what they want is they want evidence-based, right? So what that is, is a clinical trial. So, uh, of course. Know, so can you elaborate on that? Because we're not seeing the clinical trials. So, you know, what exactly, the doctors exactly. want, they don't want education, they want evidence and evidence has to come from a clinical trial. So how do we exactly. sort of resolve that problem? Exactly, you're, you're totally right. And that's why exactly why we are working with partners. And uh, I can assure you that all partners we have in the Nimbus family are uh, directly working either with um, uh, 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 general uh, practitioners in the, in the field of uh, medicine um, or uh, yeah, specific uh, neurologists or oncologists in order to sort of bring that observations up. Of course, uh, clinical trials would be much better in the end. However, everyone in this, uh, in this conversation knows how much money is spent on clinical trials. So we need to sort of uh, take the money that is still uh, available uh, because in my view, a lot of money in this industry has simply been burned. Um, uh, and um, start with certain observations. Of course, we need to leverage the, uh, uh, the revenue we make now in order to invest into those clinical trials. But clinical trials are used for medicinal, uh, and, and mainly not needed for medicinal preparation, which cannabis is at the moment. So once we are moving along the, uh, uh, along the um, uh, development of cannabis-based medicines, uh, I think in, in 10 years time, we will look back and say, look, we, we simply uh, send out uh, specific uh, um, um, flower material and, and extracts and so on. In the end, we will have that one pill, uh, which will help. But in order to get to that point, we need the evidence. And I'm, I'm, I know what, you're, what, you're, what, you're, what you want, uh, in which direction you're going. Uh, but simply we need to sort of develop that we are very very much at the beginning i always compare it to a uh, lifetime of a uh, of a human being uh, so we uh, were crawling all the time uh, uh, since we were born in 2005 already um, and uh, uh, the the legislative change in 2017 in germany uh, got us making our first steps we can now stand on our own feet mm -hmm. um, 
but uh, we, have, uh, we are uh, only about to go to kindergarten. Uh, so there are huge developments until we have our university degree in our hands. And that's what I see. If we have our university degree, then we are able to move forward with the clinical trials and so on. Mm -hmm. Right now, cannabis is a, a preparation drug. So uh, we don't uh, bring OTC products to the respective pharmacies. The pharmacies will test it again. They will repackage it. In the end, it's like a respective tincture or a respective uh, a tro topical they produce uh, with, for example, um, a different kind of flower material and so on. In the end, cannabis com can be compared to that. However, of course, we are still under the narcotic law. That's the difference. And without the evidence, can um, they be reimbursed? Sorry? You so said without this evidence, can they be reimbursed? You know, if you buy this product at the um, pharmacy, will your uh, payer co cover this? Depends. Well, yeah, no, that's, yeah. that's an interesting question, actually, because, and that's something actually we started to get into with, with MedPayRx, too. I mean, that is that is a conversation that I, and, and I, maybe this is to bounce back to Linus a little bit. I mean, it's, it's kind of this interesting multi-point aspect. The doctor, if they prescribe it, I mean, they don't have to prescribe a brand. They could prescribe, you know, I mean, you're more expert on me than Linus, but I mean, there are already, what was it? It's like 25 different kinds of cannabis in the market at different levels of THC and CBD. So if you have a, without wanting to step on anybody's brand, if the, the market is such that if your doctor is willing to prescribe, you know, cannabis flower X with X percentage THC and X percentage CBD, because they have heard that this is good for this kind of condition, that is what the German market is. I think that the problem here, certainly in the German market, is that doctors, certainly I would say within the public health infrastructure, really, really are leery of this drug because they have not seen enough trials per disease, right? And then on top of that, to Linus's point, you can be a chronic pain patient in Berlin and your insurance company, which could have been, it's not just one insurance, if you have public health insurance, it's many, your insurance company's state policies may not have accepted that yet. So in a very strange way, even though the end is actually better if you get there for German patients because if you convince people you actually can get this covered. The process is basically, to answer your question, Patrick, from at least the outside of the distributor perspective, is that the doctor ultimately is the person that you have to convince. My question to Linus, though, is, you know, you have a relationship with doctors and pharmacies and an ecosystem of people around this discussion. How has that sort of evolved in the last couple of years to the point where, you know, are you really having doctors saying, I want XYZ brand cannabis? Or are you seeing prescriptions come in, you know, or orders from pharmacies around a certain kind of, I would say, cannabis profile? Um, that's what I wanted, uh, what I stated in the beginning. Thank you for the question. I mean, the uh, the, the, the thing is, um, let's be honest, uh, a large portion of the market is currently high THC. Uh, why is that? It's, it's about that uh, getting that uh, respective uh, uh, product. Uh, we have mainly pain pa patients where THC is needed. Um, but uh, to really uh, deep dive on then what, you, what, you've, what you've said before, um, how is it changing with the doctors? How is it changing with the pharmacists? First thing um, I realized when I really stepped and looked at the market is that pharmacists came up to me and told me that the interaction with doctors is uh, increasingly better when they exchange information on, on cannabis uh, compared to other products. There is really an exchange between the two parties. In my view, um, cannabis is uh, a uh, drug that needs to be understood uh, understood to the end, uh, and we are not at the end. We are now talking about THC and CBD because uh, simply the other products we can't really uh, uh, um, uh, we can't really say how they are working. That's why I'm telling we are still somewhere uh, just before entering the kindergarten. Um, but doctors have changed. So when looking back in 2018, when I talked to doctors, they said like, okay, please stay away. I don't. I want a cannabis. Uh, it's, it's, I don't want to prescribe it, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. 
Now it's different. Oh, that's interesting. I've just talked with my pharmacist about that. Um, how can it, how does it work? What we can do? Of course, there are still those, those who say no, 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 uh, but they are getting more open-minded. Uh, um, and this is, this is a, a development which is just normal. Uh, let's be honest. Uh, there is more and more in the media. There are more and more uh, examples that it really works. And in the end, really the examples help. It, it help. So if a doctor ever tried cannabis and he has a very positive experience, he will do it again. He will try it with the next patient. And exactly developing these examples, that's crucial for this industry. We don't need that example that there is this guy who has pancreatic uh, uh, cancer, uh, it has two weeks to live, um, smokes a joint and is heal healed again. That, those are not the examples which we need. But those examples are out there. That, that, those are amazing uh, 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 stories. Uh, but what we need is there is this one patient who has a pain in his uh, in his uh, 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 sort of, for example, uh, uh, foot, uh, maybe it's a placebo pain or something like that for the last four years and he tried different kind of opioids, medication and so on. And he can now use cannabis in order to reduce that pain as an add-on medicine. Um, so really those examples are the ones which are needed. Or if we're talking about a normal rheumatic patient or a, somebody who is simply back pain over the course uh, of uh, yeah, a couple of years and is taking ibuprofen, aspirin, paracetamol or even opioids, uh, fentanyl or anything like that uh, um, and is moving towards to, towards medicinal uh, cannabis just as an add-on medicine to reduce the synthetic drugs and we are seeing this um, I'm there is one 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 pharmacy where we're very closely connected and uh, Gustav uh, will uh, will know that I'm talking about him now um, he's he's uh, 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 a very, very open-minded pharmacist. He was very interactive with a lot of companies, really deep dive into the market. And when he now sees a patient where he's giving out ibuprofen for three months uh, in a row in large quantities, he simply says, okay, don't you want to try cannabis? Is it like, what cannabis? So they are trying now to really sort of even um, leverage what they've learned from other patients uh, in order to put it to a, to a real patient, to a, to a patient, to a daily patient. Let's let's uh, call him call him the uh, that way, the daily patient who is out there uh, who really needs the pain, and not these uh, examples where we have. Of course, great examples out there, uh, Charlotte's Web and so on and so forth. There are uh, amazing examples out there, but we will need more mainstream examples. And that's what we are doing with our producers, creating those observations. Of course, they are not these clinical trials we are looking at because we are not creating something for a uh, finished uh, medicine, which is sort of in the end has a respective document with it saying you in the morning, you take two tablets, you take three tablets in the afternoon and another one just before you go to sleep. We are not there yet. At the moment we are going, um, and uh, that was the first thing I learned when I stepped onto the cannabis market, is, um, go, um, uh, start low, go slow. We really need to sort of have individual therapies for the respective patients because uh, it really depends if somebody inhales uh, uh, fast, somebody inhales slow um, and in, in, inhales often, inhales less. Uh, there are so many different factors that are out there that we really can't compare patient A to patient B. Um, uh, and need to be very individual. That's something what, of course, uh, causes a lot of work on the doctor's side, but we do see the development that doctors are now um, uh, realizing and seeing uh, examples where it really works and they're trying it again. Sometimes it doesn't work. It's not something for everyone. Uh, it is something for specific patients. And if you try to use it uh, as a doctor, you're at the first step to really uh, uh, creating new advanced therapies for your patient with a lower amount of synthetic opioids and a sort of small amount of uh, add-on therapy with cannabis, either extracts or um, cannabis flower. How much of this discussion is being driven by the patient themselves, where they're asking for it? And, you know, because you sort of alluded that, you know, the doctors are, are, you know, talking to the pharmacist. But I would think that a fair amount of the reason why the doctors are talking to the pharmacist is in response from, you know, the patients are aware this is out there. They're reading stuff on online, whether it's reliable or not. That's a whole other discussion. Um, but, you know, they're going to their primary care folks and saying, look, you know, why can't we try this? How much of that is being driven by the patient? 
I don't, I don't want to talk about. Sorry. I, I don't I don't want I don't want to talk about percentages here. But of course, uh, in the beginning, it's a very it was a very patient driven market. Let's be honest. We had a thousand of uh, cannabis patients before the legislation started, and now uh, we are looking at a way larger number. Um, uh, a, large, a number that has increased over time, and uh, I still count uh, uh, most of the patients to a very patient-driven market. Um, of course, they are uh, asking for that product because they maybe read something about it, they heard something from a friend uh, or a friend of a friend. Um, uh, that's usually those questions which you see online. I'm asking this question for a friend of a friend because there's still the stigma uh, with, the, with, the, um, with the cannabis itself. But um, that's, that was sort of the first wave of patients, the early adopters, where we are very, um, um, uh, quite to be, to be frank, um, very happy about that this, this group of patients do exist. Um, but now it really comes to, let's say, the second wave or even the third wave of patients where we uh, are uh, turning around. And that's how the market uh, develops. So uh, for this third wave or, th or second wave, we need, uh, exactly the doctors, because uh, those patients would never um, ask for cannabis. They would uh, uh, get the therapy and they would listen uh, to the doctors as uh, uh, they know what they are doing um, and uh, want to have the, the therapy that heals uh, or even reduces the pain. Uh, that's, that's the first start of uh, a, a good therapy, in my view, um, that we are reducing the pain and reducing sort of the side effects of other uh, medications uh, with, uh, with uh, medicinal cannabis. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's that's really it, and that's where we need the doctors, um, and where we need sort of the uh, broad understanding how cannabis can be used. Of course, it would be the best if we have a table. We have patient A, for example, pain therapy, certain kind of uh, uh, pain factor. Uh, he takes three drops of an extract in the morning, four drops in the evening, uh, and then he's good to go. But at the moment, since we are not able to make these clinical trials because of uh, the respective money that we are missing in order to sort of fulfill that, um, we are um, we are we well we need to sort of make small uh, and uh, observation. And now I'm opening the question about what is really evidence. I'm sorry that I'm uh, moving into that direction again. For me, evidence is basically everything that we are we can look at, everything that is recorded in a uh, in a manner that it can be it can be taken in order to sort of uh, uh, create a therapy or even um, um, understand how why that respective therapy has worked. So it can be one patient. Of course, it's better to have more um, uh, in the end and look at, for example, a group of 25. To 250 uh, patients uh, in a respective di uh, disease, uh, but we are not there yet. So uh, we, of course, keeping our heads out of the out of the water in order to sort of uh, create little observations. But that's already a, a huge step forward uh, that we uh, that we have and collect this information and use that. Um, in the end, uh, of course, in order to sort of have the full-blown doctors be behind you and uh, develop to market to maybe have even a fourth or fifth wave of patients, um, uh, we need uh, uh, more evidence, more clinical trials. But let's, let's do one step at a time. Let's focus on the second wave or how I call it third wave first before we really dive into fourth and fifth. Well, let's, let's just, let me, let me follow up on this wave analogy because I think to Patrick's point and to your point, um, Linus, I think that there are multiple waves that maybe feed on each other. I will say in my own experience, both as a journalist, but also sort of now directly engaging doctors also as a patient here, um, I think it really depends on the patient. Because if you are insistent, I would say in my experience so far in the German healthcare system, certainly at this point, they are going to listen. I mean, at, you know, three years into it, if there's anything that has changed dramatically, it is that suddenly everybody has heard about medical cannabis, whether they like it or not, or would freely prescribe it or not. But if you as a German patient within the German healthcare system credibly say to a doctor at this point, I have this condition, and it's certainly when it falls into a range of what we know that they've already prescribed it for, right? It's not just chronic pain, although that is the vast majority. You know, in Germany, it's even being prescribed for ADHD. It's certainly being prescribed for AIDS. There are, you know, ways in which this is, you know, they're, they're certainly looking at this. And I would say 
of any country that I have lived in, there is, even though it's not perfect, even though there are major problems, doctors, even though they will say, I don't like it, will take you seriously as a patient. So my question to you is, in all of these waves going on, you know, maybe, it, maybe it's the Nimbus boy, but clearly I would say that, that patients themselves still need to be educated on how to talk to doctors. So it, while, yes, clearly doctor education is desperately needed, I would still say that in this market, there is a huge need for consumer-facing education. And some of that's gonna have to come from the industry. And that includes people like yourselves. How are you addressing that? Well, of course, um, we are a, a pharmaceutical manufacturer and wholesaler, and we are not allowed in the, by the narcotic law to interact with, with patients. So, um, the, of course, the, the, uh, to, 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 be, to be honest, Marguerite, we, we are not able to uh, really facilitate uh, on the uh, patient side, unfortunately. But we do have programs. Um, I'm... Uh, uh, um, if we're looking at the different kind of hotlines that are out there now, um, um, a, a good friend of mine, Lisa Haag, is uh, providing a lot of education for the uh, patients uh, on the one hand and really guiding them through the post process. Um, it is, it is, uh, it is urgently needed, of course, um, and it, of course, it is needed that they are informed about what are their rights, what are they allowed to do, how do they speak to the doctor, to which doctor I go to, um, and so on. Um, but that's definitely something what we can, can't, can take up. What we can do, however, we can actually um, move uh, 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 along, like in formats like we are talking about, um, really do um, uh, uh, a um, education on the side that uh, there are these programs, that they, these are programs are followed, and we also have a huge uh, um, patient-based um, group and association which they can sort of now link to in order to educate um, uh, Daniela Joachim is uh, for example the uh, the responsible person for the uh, BDCAN which is the Cannabis Patients uh, Association that's very interesting that's where you can approach as a uh, as an uh, as a as a patient because simply by law we are not allowed to do and uh, we are not allowed to inter inter interact and engage with patients um, luckily we do have uh, uh, a cannabis patient also on our team, um, uh, somebody that has been um, uh, very, very sick because of uh, the intake of synthetic uh, uh, medicines and uh, is now even uh, creating a, a certain kind of um, a, yeah, um, step back from, from all that is synthetic. Uh, so cannabis is the only, the only way how to really treat her. And she, said she, uh, she tells me, for example, that no, I'm not interested uh, in, in using that cannabis, but it's the only thing that really helps. And I'm the first person who gets rid of cannabis uh, if my therapy is really uh, sufficient. So uh, we do have uh, that experience uh, in, our, in, our, in our team, but uh, of course we are not allowed to, to move out with that uh, information directly to patients, unfortunately. Uh, but that's, that's also good. It's, uh, it is, it should be, a, uh, 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 it should be a company's interest to really interact with open um, information uh, uh, towards doctors, but of course not uh, convince uh, patients with a certain advertisement uh, in a direction where they may not need it, because in the end it should be the doctor's um, experience that decides. So in ideal market, if you ask myself, the a doctor know exactly what to prescribe when and, uh, and how, uh, and simply interacts with the respective pharmacists on um, the information he has additionally to those kind of products. And we, in the end, provide them with new products, new uh, um, uh, uh, trials, new observations, and so on and so forth. That would be the ideal world, but we are yeah, simply uh, a couple of years away from yeah, that. Yeah, uh, what you just said is an interesting point, the fact that uh, um, you um, uh, are not allowed to actually um, promote your product directly to, the, uh, to patients, because in other parts of the world, it's different as well. Uh, um, do you know how it is? Is Germany unique within Europe that way, or are all European countries? Uh, it's Europe wide. It's a Europe wide thing. It's Europe wide. You're not allowed to advertise pharmaceuticals, which is one of the reasons why this whole discussion is so interesting right now. 
but you are allowed to engage in a conversation about certain kinds of therapy, which is kind of why I threw that question out at Linus. I mean, this is the question that I, I see everybody in this industry struggling with. So for example, you know, I mean, nobody is allowed to advocate for cannabis, right? I mean, the pharmacists that we've all talked to, they're not allowed to advocate or advertise the fact that they carry cannabis. At the same time, there are many different kinds of cannabis, number one. And number two, how do you deal with cannabis, the plant, cannabis, the, you know, as a broad overview medication term, because there are different medications and there are different genuses. So I think, yes, very much to Linus's point, that is an evolving space. And to your point, Martin, there are European rules. And then there are, of course, as we all would might expect, stricter German rules. But in general, you are not allowed to advertise pharmaceuticals in Europe. That's an EU discussion, not a German one. God, I miss the U.S. We advertise everything. <laughs> well, and we I, have I want no to the epidemic exactly. too. So you know, there's there's that. <laughs> I wanted to bring that up specifically because a lot of listeners or people that are watching this later might uh, be from a country where that is not the case. And yeah. if they're looking at uh, coming to Europe, coming to Germany. That well, I think, I think that, that, that's kind of why I was wanted to throw, throw this back now to Linus, because, I mean, there are, there's really an international group of people on this call. Um, and, and I think for Germans who are like, oh, my God, you're allowed to advertise a drug. I mean, I think that there definitely is a culture clash that is coming together on the medical cannabis space, especially as more Americans. And I think it's different in Canada, but certainly as North Americans start to look at the German market and, and like, oh, my God, you can't do this. So I think within that discussion, there have to be new strategies to deal with this because it's different, you know, cannabis as a plant and cannabis as a potential therapy is a very different discussion than having a discussion, oh, XYZ brand names, product, blah, blah, blah for this disease. I mean, that's product placement. But I think that that is also a discussion that no one really wants to get caught in having especially in a German market, and I don't want to mention any names, where there have been a couple of producers, especially from Canada, who have gotten dinged. <laughs> you won't mention any names. <laughs> For Ms. Steffing, no, there are no names. But I mean, you know, it's, I guess so that's kind of the odd question to line, you know, to flip this back to Linus. I mean, he's a German, obviously very educated about this market, but it's like, you're almost, like, it sounds to me, I mean, and this is, this is the funny, almost schism, like, you know, Linus has learned his market and is swimming along like a duck in water. And then there are all of these other people who are coming in with product and going, well, why can't you do this? And I think what is interesting to me about what Linus and I've seen his team do is like, they're trying to chart this way. I mean, you're not breaking any laws, you're staying within the regulatory guidelines, but at the same time, you're trying to advance the entire issue. It's really, that's, that's why I really love what, you know, what, love watching you guys go out there and, and succeed because it's really an interesting and hard to walk path that seems to be changing daily, right? Yeah, well, basically, I mean, we are all standing at the same hill. Um, we all need to push really hard. And only if we, if we push that stone together uh, over the hill, it, it works out. And that's uh, why we are interacting uh, with uh, a group com of com competitors uh, uh, bi-monthly uh, and are really developing strategies and how we can sort of really develop this market even further. Um, because it only goes with credibility, in my view. Um, we don't need to, and that's the thing, we don't need to talk about um, EU GMP, we don't need to talk about GAC, we, this should be a standard. Uh, it should be understood that we really are looking at uh, a specific pharmaceutical, and for pharmaceutical, certain things are normal. Uh, same as, for example, if I compare that to Fresenius. So if we are uh, uh, creating a new, or if we were, uh, I must say, uh, creating new product at, at Fresenius, uh, we are uh, the producer. Um, we are, of course, heavily engaged in bringing um, our brand to the market. So uh, all the sales uh, organization is uh, with, with towards facing, doctor facing, is was within, within Fresenius. Of course, we use different kind of uh, people um, out there and, and also additional um, uh, sales teams which we, which, which we could sort of work with. Uh, but in the end, in the end it's the, um, yeah, uh, uh, it's, the, it's the producer, the brand who needs to really create uh, the market demand for it. In the end, the distributors are used because they are uh, very well in what they are 
good at. So it's distribution on the one hand. Uh, in the cannabis industry, that's slightly different. So you really need to interact. You don't need managers. You need people to do something, who really um, take up what is there uh, and try to develop a strategy on how to move forward. Um, and that's what, I, uh, what I've seen in the past. I've seen a lot of managers in this market, um, a lot of people uh, with uh, a, a great ideas, um, and um, just uh, that that mix makes it so uh, so interesting in my view. So uh, um, of course they are out there. We are sitting together. We are developing new ideas, new strategies together. In the end, we are all competitors, but we really try to sort of develop this market together. And that's very very interesting to see. It is not yet that elbow uh, farmer thing. Uh, it is it is at the moment the market which uh, it's it's fun to be in. Of course we have huge struggles uh, if there is no product coming or if something takes longer. Um, but um, if you compare that to uh, when I first looked into the market in 2015 to now, um, or even in the course of 2016 with the legislative uh, change in 2017, I think we've made huge step forwards and can say that we are developing uh, uh, quite good uh, in the pace a normal pharmaceutical market develops. Martin, do you have any more questions for Linus? No, I'm fine right now. I think it's maybe that was a really good final wrap up there from, uh, from Linus. I do too. Patrick, do you have any more last questions or does anybody else on the line, if there are any, I can't see, I'm, I'm on my cell phone right now. Does anybody else have any other questions for, for Linus? No, I think we very much appreciate your time and, and coming to speak with us and sharing your insights. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, that was very good, Linus. Very insightful, understanding the German market better, distribution in Germany, the German patients, the German doctors, pharmacies. Very good. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, we will also be paid. Oh, thank you again to everybody for making this possible. We will also be posting this on our YouTube channel. And uh, we will have a very interesting guest uh, in two weeks time, um, who is the Undersecretary of Agriculture for Ecuador. So there are all sorts of interesting questions and conversations swirling, and we are delighted that people are starting to come to us to start to uh, point that conversation off. And what uh, would they search for on YouTube to find us? I'm sorry. What would they search for on YouTube to find us? Oh, clearly cannabis. Thank you. Right? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank, thank, thank you very much for having me. Thank you a lot for the questions. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a pleasure. Um, uh, and for the YouTubers who are now uh, not, a, uh, I've just checked the chat and I think we've answered all of the questions that were in there. Um, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to post us a message. Uh, we are on every uh, sort of uh, social media channel, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, just post us a message or even uh, via email contact at nimbus.health. Um, we are uh, more than happy uh, to interact with you and uh, help you guide your way through uh, the German market. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.